Uh, I'm Brandon Unruh. I'm very glad to be back. I think it's been about a year since I've been in this forum, and it's always heartening to hear and see that there's so much support for people learning about these issues. There's for a long time here at McLean been a, a, a long-standing community of family members and concerned loved ones supporting uh, the people who receive treatment here. So it's nice to see everyone here. I always have a little uh, a nice feeling inside when I see you all here. So my goal tonight is to give you a little bit of a sense of what I'm going to call the spirit of mentalizing. And I want to first just to take a poll about who, who among the crowd has actually heard this word, mentalizing or mentalization? Most people, almost everyone actually. So we'll do a little bit of defining of the terms, but let me, let me kind of orient you to what I would like to do. So first I want to give you a clear sense of what mentalizing is, just to give you some definitions. Why it's a good thing to be able to mentalize and then give some illustrations of how mentalizing can go offline for all of us in certain circumstances. Secondly, I want to illustrate something about why mentalizing is actually relevant to borderline personality disorder, both to thinking about it, conceptualizing its origins and what sustains the symptoms over time, and to treating it. And we'll t I'll talk a little bit about how a treatment approach that focuses on enhancing a person's mentalizing capacity at every moment in the treatment actually may optimize the benefits of treatment for borderline personality disorder. And thirdly, I want to talk a little bit about how the components of a mentalizing stance, which I'll define for you, how taking a mentalizing stance as parents and family members can actually perhaps help you see some benefits of, in your interactions with your loved ones that are affected with BPD. So first, just some very brief acknowledgments. So I always like to acknowledge Anthony Bateman and Peter Fonagy, who are the developers of this approach to treatment. And they've really mentored and supervised our mentalization treatment team here at McLean. They've also supported the development of our clinic. And uh, our clinic is actually modeled on their clinic in London which has published a number of studies demonstrating in an evidence-based manner the efficacy of this approach to treating borderline personality disorder. McLean also has established an ongoing relationship with these two clinicians such that they supervise and continue to train other clinicians who are interested in learning this treatment model through trainings that they offer here at, at McLean. And actually one of these trainings is coming up next month if anyone is interested. I also just want to briefly mention John Allen from the Menninger Clinic, who provides such wonderful, lucid explanations and illustrations of mentalizing and problems in mentalizing. So I like to reference his writings, from which I borrow pretty liberally in terms of teaching and talking about these, these, uh, this material. So I want to give credit to all three of them for a lot of what I'm going to say to you tonight. I don't claim to be saying much that's original. And then finally, just to acknowledge the people who are involved with me in the mentalization clinic team in the outpatient clinic here. And I'll say a little bit more about what we do in the treatment. So first of all, what is mentalizing? Just to start with a basic definition. Well, one way to tell you about what mentalizing is is to tell you first what it's not. So we use this thought experiment developed by Simon Baron Cohen in London called mind blindness. And this illustrates the importance of having a mentalizing capacity in the first place. So to read along with me, imagine what your world would be like if you were aware of physical things but blind to the existence of mental things, blind to things like thoughts, beliefs, knowledge, desires, and intentions. Now stretch your imagination to consider what sense you could make of human action. So in other words, how confusing and frightening the world would actually be if we always lived in this state of mind blindness, if we had no way to actually make sense of what was going on in other people's minds. The opposite, then, of being completely mind-blinded would be to be a perfect mind-reader, to always have the ability to see directly anything that's going on in anyone else's mind, and to fully know what's in your own mind. Can you imagine never being able to turn off that awareness of what's in everyone else's mind around you? Most people would sort of imagine that's a, a kind of a terrible power to have. And when we ask people if they want this power, most people say no. Now, if things go basically well throughout the course of a person's development, we all end up living somewhere in between these two extremes of total mind blindness and perfect mind reading. We end up having some capacity to have a sense of what goes on in other people's minds, but we can never be perfect mind readers. 
So instead, we have to make do with this kind of intermediate space. And that's what we call mentalizing. So what is it exactly that we're doing when we actively mentalize someone or something? Well, the way I like to illustrate this is to have you actually do it rather than telling you about it. So here's an interactive mentalizing experiment. And this is called the reading the mind and the eyes test. Has anyone seen this before? Maybe last year when I was here? No. So this is again developed by Simon Baron Cohen. And it's a simple test that prompts you to mentalize what might be going on in the mind of this person. And all you can see is their eyes. So let's just everybody say out loud, if you had to pick what emotion or mind state might be linked with this kind of expression, what would most people say? Just say it out loud. Playful, Playful right? <coughs> That's right. Next one. Take a moment. Say it out loud. What do you think? Can everybody say? Desire. Quite right. You're good mentalizers. Worried. 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 I think you all do better than I do on this, actually. <laughs> so now let me give you kind of a jargony definition. And what you just did was actually to use certain aspects of mentalizing. You were reading something about the external cues, something on the outside of a person, the eyes, the gaze, the what's in the eyes, to read something that's actually behind the eyes, to read into a person's mental state, some emotion. So that's an example of using external cues to mentalize about something that's internal. So that's one example of mentalizing. But let me give you kind of the nice jargony definition about what this is. So this is from Bateman and Fonagy who developed the treatment. They say mentalizing is the mental process by which an individual interprets the actions of herself and others as meaningful on the basis of intentional mental states, such as desires, needs, feelings, beliefs, and reasons. So we can boil this down to saying, we're just talking about understanding behavior in terms of mental states and what goes on in the mind. It's really as simple as that. It's a simple concept. And mentalizing is something that we all do. We all have the capacity to do. And we all do this every day. So just some everyday examples again. Let's say you're sitting quietly with a friend at a coffee shop. And all of a sudden, your friend looks away from the table and clenches up his fists and suddenly starts to cry. And it seems that this has sort of come out of nowhere. And you're trying to then think about, well, how can I even console this person? Well, first, you've got to ask yourself, what mental state prompted the tears? What was it that happened just now that wasn't visible on the outside to make the external aspects of the situation visible, the crying, the turning away? So you've first got to construct some sense of what's going on in the mind before you can helpfully respond to the person. It's another everyday example of mentalizing. So this is something we all do automatically most of the time. We're all capable of doing this. You don't need to be a therapist to be able to mentalize, just like you don't need to study linguistics in order to use language, right? But despite all of us having some developmental capacity to mentalize, doing this well is also a skill that we need to practice at different points in time. Two situations in particular tend to interfere with our ability to mentalize, and they would be probably what you would imagine, the first being any increase in emotional intensity and the second being some kind of threat or risk in an attachment relationship, a relationship that's important to us. So in those situations, which often occur in family relationships, most people's ability to mentalize in a nuanced way goes offline. And we'll talk more about how this is different in borderline personality disorder. But first let me say a little bit about good mentalizing. Oh, here's my non-jargony definitions of mentalizing. So again, this comes from the writings of other people about this. But this can be a helpful way of thinking about it more conversationally. So we're just talking about attending to mental states. Some people say holding mind in mind. That makes it sound really like it's a purely cognitive thing. But actually, we want to talk about holding the mind and the heart in mind and heart at the same time, too. Mentalizing, as you'll see, is about both a cognitive process and an emotional process simultaneously. Seeing others from the inside and ourselves from the outside. That's probably the one that I like the, the best. Thinking and feeling clearly at the same time. We've just gone through some ordinary examples. So what does good mentalizing look like versus poor mentalizing? Well, in MBT, or mentalization-based treatment, which was originally a treatment developed for borderline personality disorder, but is now showing that there's some extensions to other mental health problems. In MBT, one way that we judge the quality of mentalizing at any given moment 
is based on how easily a person appears to be integrating these different components of mental experience at one time. So we call these the polarities of mentalizing. And you see these mapped out in a straightforward way here. So let's just go through each of these. Self versus other. So you get a sense about what, what we mean, what we look for. Well, we can mentalize to understand the behavior of others. We, we can mentalize others. So for example, if someone cuts in front of me at Starbucks, I can say, well, did he deliberately cut in front of me just to spite me? Or was there something unintentional about it? There I am mentalizing someone else. But we can also mentalize, and we need to mentalize, to better understand our own selves. So I could think, well, how is it that I could have loaned that person more money again when I knew full well that he hasn't paid me back the last five times? So what exactly was going on there for me that I made that decision? In terms of internal versus external distinctions, there are mentalizing questions about behavior, which is an external feature of who we are. But we can also mentalize to better understand internal things, like mind states. So an example would be, you know, how is it that I went from being really anxious about talking to all of you before I started talking, but now that I've started talking, I actually don't feel anxious? What has shifted inside of me to make that happen? So there I am mentalizing about something that's internal. Um, I could ask a question about myself over time, like um, how am I a different person today compared with the person that I was when I was 16 years old? How have the stuff that's inside me that makes up who I am, how's that changed? Or how did my early life experiences shape who I am today? These are internal mentalizing questions. We can mentalize to look past the external visible behavior of other people to better understand what's going on inside of them internally. So I could say, that student of mine, he seemed really angry with me, but I wonder if he was angry because I'd said something that made him feel ashamed or vulnerable. So I'm speculating beyond what I see immediately on the outside. Anyway, I'm belaboring the point. You get the idea, probably. What about this cognitive versus emotional distinction? Well, we say good mentalizing involves both a cognitive and an emotional process. It's cognitive because it involves deciding what we think about ourselves or someone else. It involves arriving at some conclusion. But it's also emotional, because it requires experiencing one's own emotions in relation to others at the same time. So when a person is doing a lot of thinking out loud, for example, but they seem really disconnected from emotions, we might say this is a sign of not so great mentalizing. They're sort of stuck on the cognitive end of this polarity, but there's, they're not able to fluidly shift over to incorporate emotional experiencing. Certainty versus doubt. Good mentalizing, we say, involves experiences of both certainty and doubt. So in the sense that some aspects of our own minds and other people's minds seem very clear to us, and some other aspects seem very opaque or unknowable initially. So we might say, you know, I know I was feeling angry, but I don't have the foggiest idea at the moment about what caused me to be so angry about that. Or I see that I've offended that person, but I'm really not sure how I did that or what it was that caused the offense. So in MBT, we always have these polarities in mind. And we're always assessing how well are we doing as therapists to manage mentalizing across these polarities, and then how well is the individual that we're working with doing. We often worry that we're going to get stuck on one end and not be able to fluidly incorporate both ends of these polarities. So one of the technical aspects of MBT that we train therapists in the MBT clinic to do is to practice noticing signs of losing mentalizing in oneself and in other people. And the basic task, I'm giving you the whole sort of basic principle of MBT right here. When there's a break in mentalizing or a loss in the ability to mentalize, either in oneself as the therapist or in the patient, then the task is to rewind back to the moment before mentalizing was lost, and then sort of walk it forward and make sense of what happened there. So it's a way of dealing, it's sort of taking the kinds of misunderstandings, conflicts, and injuries that are bound to happen between people working intensely together and making sense of them in a joint mentalizing process. So keeping these polarities in mind, let me give you an example from the adult attachment interview which is a formal way of assessing mentalizing capacities. People might be familiar with this. So the question on the attachment interview is a standard one. It says, why do you think your parents behaved as they did during your childhood? So here's a sample answer. And I want you to think, given what you've just learned about these polarities, 
is this basically good mentalizing or not so good mentalizing? So the answer says, because I think perhaps I was a very demanding child that needed a lot of attention. My mother, for whatever reason, wasn't able to give me that attention. And I don't know for sure, but I suppose that we were quite naughty as children. Or maybe to her we appeared to be naughty. And therefore she was constantly having to chastise us. Decent mentalizing, terrible mentalizing, what do you all think? What are the components that you see there of one or the other? Good, decent, right? Decent to good. So there's a couple of particular things about that paragraph that we could say are evidence of someone's actively mentalizing to some degree as they're thinking back about a situation with parents that must have been quite difficult. So it's somewhat flexible. It's a little bit tentative. The person is not completely certain at every point throughout. And, this, and the person is differentiating between his or her own perspective on the situation and others' perspectives. So there's some movement from self to other, from certainty to doubt, and internal to external. What I feel on the inside, what it might be like to other, for others on the outside. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now in contrast, compare this answer to the same question. How the hell should I know? Go ask them. You're the bloody psychiatrist. A few Britishisms in here. This is a British treatment. They've just always been terrible parents. And I'm sure no one in this room has heard that. So, this is an example of not so good mentalizing. It probably goes without saying. So another way that we have as MBT therapists of judging the quality of mentalizing in any given circumstance is to watch out for these particularly common non-mentalizing modes. So we call these uh, signs of poor mentalizing. And these three are particularly common, not just in borderline personality disorder, but in all of us when we're not mentalizing. But we see them more frequently in BPD. So the first is psychic equivalence. So this is essentially a type of concrete thinking in which the mental reality equals the outer reality. So an example of this would be a child who is afraid of a tiger being under the bed, a small child. And as soon as the lights go off, that tiger is back there. I just know that tiger is there because I'm scared about it and I can picture him. And the parent comes in the room and turns the lights on and says, look, no tiger there. And in that moment, the child says, oh, no tiger. But as soon as the door gets closed and the lights go off again, there's that internal experience of fear. The tiger is there. And that means the tiger actually is there. Does that make sense? That's psychic equivalence. Another more interpersonal example of that, a common one that comes up in BPD, is let's say someone gets worried about being dumped by a romantic partner. And just the fact of having the worry about that happening translates into an assumption that it is about to happen, or an experience of that person already plotting this to happen. Right? So the emotional experience gets converted into a physical reality. And there's less doubt about it. There's less of an ability to sort out, is it just me having some kind of emotional reaction to something, uh, versus is it the reality of what's about to happen? The next one is what we call teleological mode. That's a fun word to say if you practice it a few times. And this has to do with when internal states of mind get reduced to observable behaviors. So let me say what I mean by that. What I mean is that mental realities, things in the mind, like feelings and intentions, only seem real to a person if there's some physical, some physical proof of them, if they get manifested through some observable behavior or event. So an example would be, I know she doesn't love me because she didn't text me back within five minutes. So she, if, she, if she did love me, she definitely would have texted back. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Right? So the only way I feel loved or cared about in that moment is if there's a physical proof or reassurance of that. It's hard to hold in the mind that sense that someone might care or love without the physical proof of it. That's teleological mode. And then finally, pretend mode. So this is different. This is where there's a decoupling of things in the mind from outer realities. So this is where mental events get disconnected from what's going on in the rest of the world. So this, a common thing that we see a lot as therapists, is a long-running psychotherapy where there's a lot of talk between the patient and the therapist. There's talk over and over again in an apparently insightful way, but there's never any change. There's no behavioral change. And that's actually an experience that a lot of people with borderline personality disorder have before getting into other kinds of treatments. 
There are certain kinds of therapies that can sort of promote falling into that pretend mode, and then there's certain kinds of treatments that really promote the therapist and the patient looking together to make sure they don't fall into that. And MBT gives us some principles for making sure we don't do a long-running treatment for years and years that doesn't produce any change. So sometimes, I'll just be brief about this, people sometimes wonder about how mentalizing is different from these other concepts. I think, did Jillian Galen just talk about mindfulness fairly recently? Yeah, so you may already have a sense of how this is different, but briefly what I'll say is that empathy is really about attending to other people's mental states. And we might say that that's one half of mentalizing, but the other half is attending to our own mental states, right? Mindfulness is really about focusing in on the, the realities only of the present. And it, it can be not just about what's in the mind, but it can be about physical, inanimate objects. I can practice mindfulness to um, the colors in the room, for example, or the feel of the wind you know, through my hair as I walk outside, that sort of thing. But mentalizing is specifically about <coughs> attending to what's in the mind, specifically. So we could say it's sort of mindfulness about the mind and our own mind and the minds of others. All right, so we're doing a lot of preface here. I hope you're bearing with me. I know it's a lot of exposition. Why is, it, why is this a good thing? If it's not already obvious, let me say a little bit about this. General benefits of mentalizing include building and sustaining fulfilling relationships. This is kind of obvious, but having that capacity to mentalize, especially in moments of conflict, injuries, and misunderstandings, allows us to sort of work out what happens when people get closer to one another. In order to feel connected to others, we have to be able to understand how our perception of ourselves actually differs quite a lot sometimes between other people's perception of ourselves. We have to see that our version of a particular thing that's happened may not be the only one on the market, and that actually multiple perspectives may be acceptable. We have to increase our empathy for other people's perspectives and get that sense of sort of seeing what it's like for someone from the inside even though we're on the outside. So good mentalizing helps to promote interpersonal stability. Secondly, good mentalizing helps to stabilize a sense of self, that subjective sense of who one is over time, having some coherent narrative of the self over time. And mentalizing helps to increase self-awareness of the different layers and nuances in one's own mind and how these things shift over time. It increases a sense of self-agency over one's own behavior. It gets us away from this experience of behaviors just are just things that happen, things that we do without knowing why we do them. Thirdly, good mentalizing helps us to regulate emotion. So it helps us look deeper at our emotions, sort of looking at what brought them up in the first place, resisting making snap judgments on the basis of what we're feeling, and noticing mixtures of emotions, sort of looking beyond the first emotion that we notice, but looking to see, well, is there some shame underneath that anger? And then fourthly, mentalizing, good mentalizing helps to decrease impulsive and self-destructive behavior. It helps us push the pause button and take the time that we need to think through our needs and our feelings and how to manage these best before we respond in the first way that comes to mind. Now, this may all seem totally self-evident, but notice that the way that I've categorized these is that these are the four core areas of dysfunction in borderline personality disorder. Are people recognizing that? So the four core areas, depending on almost irregardless of who you speak with, most theorists around BPD now agree that these four areas are core areas of instability. So interpersonal relationships, that sense of self and identity, identity disturbances, emotion regulation and anger discontrol, and uh, behavioral control, impulsivity. So MBT as a treatment approach and as a conceptualization of borderline personality disorder posits <coughs> that these core symptoms of borderline personality disorder are caused by an unstable capacity to mentalize that's context dependent, that goes offline much more quickly and it's harder to get back if you've got BPD. So all the symptoms of BPD, like unstable relationships, identity disturbances, suicidal or self-injurious behavior, anger discontrol, all these things MBT would say typically arise in moments where mental mentalizing has gone offline. And so by getting the ability to mentalize back online in the moment, we can help people minimize these problems. 
So what causes, though, the, this temporary failure of mentalization in the first place? Well, the idea is that that temporary failure, this is a complicated sl small text, but the idea is basically at the top you see this temporary failure of mentalization. And the idea is that that causes the emergence of those three non-mentalizing modes that we talked about, pretend mode, psychic equivalence, and teleological mode. And then once a person is in these kinds of non-mentalizing modes of experience, the risk goes up for a person to try to solve whatever the emotional problem or interpersonal problem is in a non-mentalizing state. And unfortunately, that increases their risk for things like self-injury, suicide, angry outbursts, emotional dysregulation, ineffective interpersonal coping strategies. But what causes the temporary failure of mentalization at the top in the first place? Well, again, it's those two things that I talked about. So first, emotional arousal or increase in emotional intensity of any kind can threaten that capacity to mentalize. And then some sense of a threat or a risk in some relationship that one cares about, an attachment threat. Starting a new relationship, uh, sensing that someone one is currently in a relationship with may not feel the same way. Breakups, leaving the nest, leaving the support of family, leaving home after high school, going off to college, leaving college, going off to live on one's own. All these kinds of things are, can be threats to that sense of feeling that other people are, are present in a stable way, that support is there. So to summarize what we've said so far, if we move this forward. So MBT posits that the core vulnerability in borderline personality disorder is an unstable capacity to mentalize that gets impaired by emotional arousal and by challenges within attachment relationships. And when a person becomes unable to mentalize, the symptoms of BPD emerge. We, that makes sense so far? So to try to move, sort of bring all this together, how does MBT as a treatment approach actually channel these principles that we've discussed so far into a treatment modality, a treatment approach? How does this actually work? So we have to do a very quick detour here into a little bit of attachment theory to think about first how we normally learn this capacity to mentalize. So the first thing to realize is that learning to do this is not like learning the surgical technique or memorizing an equation. It's more like uh, an implicit or unconscious process. It's more like learning to ride a bike or learning language. But basically, we learn to mentalize through our early attachment relationships with people in the environment in a caregiving position. So attachment theory, and this is like boiling it all down to oversimplifying it, probably unfortunately. But attachment theory posits that <coughs> personality features, such as a person's sense of self and their capacity to regulate emotions and behavior and templates for interpersonal relationships, all of these things arise through transactions <coughs> with, with caregivers in the early environment. So the basic idea is that children learn to mentalize well when they are mentalized well by the environment, especially around their emotions. So when caretakers actively hold a child's mind in their mind, even before a baby learns to develop any capacity for verbal language, mentalizing starts to flourish. And we know this from early infant studies. So this happens during the first year of life, actually. So just weeks after birth, a baby will begin to smile at human beings more frequently than the baby will smile at inanimate objects. So early on, there's some recognition of minds over things. Later on, babies start to engage the attention of the caregiver by pointing and verbalizing or vocalizing. And then by the nursery years, ch children start to exhibit uh, more complex social tactics, which show that their theory of other people's minds is becoming more nuanced. They'll tease, or they'll lie, uh, or they'll say things to save face. So showing a more nuanced work understanding of the workings of others' minds. And by age five or six, they will tell white lies to protect other people's feelings, not just to avoid being punished, but out of some empathy. So all of these processes go well when the parent is actively constructing and reconstructing in their mind an image of the child's mind. So inside their own mind, caregivers have to constantly work to grasp the mind of the child. 
and metabolize the child's experience and then create a model of that experience in their own mind which then gets fed back to the child. And let me show you just briefly a little bit how this works. We call this a mirroring process because the parent's representation of the child's mind serves as a mirror that gets sort of, that generates a new representation in the child's mind of his own experience. So this slide illustrates this process in a nutshell. So basically you have the child in some state of uh, emotional arousal, hunger or pain, something like that. And say that the child bumped his head while he was crawling on the floor, for example. And the child signals to the caregiver through crying, say a nonverbal expression of emotion. The child signals to the caregiver that uh, there's, there's distress. And so the baby cries. And the caregiver, if all's going well, doesn't just mimic exactly the child's communication. The caregiver doesn't cry or wail back at the child, right? But that would terrify the child because it communicates that your mind state is equivalent to the child's mind state, terror and terror. But instead, the child's, if all's going well, the child's mind state resonates with the parent's mind state, and then it gets metabolized, reflected on, before it gets expressed again in this metabolized form. We call that the mirroring display of metabolized emotion. So this communicates that the child's pain has been accurately grasped, but something else has been added in, the parent's own experience of the child's pain. So instead of screaming back at the child, what do most parents do when the baby falls and bumps his head? We say, oh, oh, rather than crying or wailing right back. So these early communications in these early attachment relationships foster that capacity in children to develop this capacity to regulate their own emotions, to have some sense that there are trusting, trustworthy other people in the world that can be gone to when one is in distress. So you can see, you get like some overall sense about how these early templates for relationships can get laid down from an attachment theory perspective. So the basic principle here is that as a child, the experience of being accurately understood by one's early caregivers can help to foster that sense of secure attachment. And in turn, that creates the freedom for the child's mind to flourish in its mentalizing capacity. Now, I do want to be careful to say that attachment is not simply a result of interactions with parents or caregivers or the early environment. There are a lot of biological genetic components of this as well. But we're highlighting here the environmental. Because as you can see, this is actually not just a model for parenting but it's actually a model in MBT for psychotherapy as well. So let me say a little bit more about how this actually works. So I have said that the, the most common triggers for non-mentalizing are increased emotional arousal and activation of that attachment, that sense of attachment threat. So if you think about a person with borderline personality disorder starting out in a brand new psychotherapy, what you realize is that actually both of those factors are, are often at play at the beginning. So starting a new relationship with a therapist presents these significant challenges to mentalizing because there's a new mind to contend with that's going to be exploring and probing and relating to your own mind. So the very presence of the therapist's mind, getting in close, asking intimate questions, exploring the patient's mind, while the patient has to contend with what's going on in the therapist's mind, that's actually very uh, anxiety provoking for a lot of folks. So the therapist's mere presence in the room as a curious, concerned person actually can sometimes cause harm in treatment. And it can actually make getting started in a new treatment very difficult. So in MBT, we take a little different approach to this. When we get started with the mentalizing treatment, we actually learn how to take this basic, what we'll call the basic mentalizing stance. And the purpose of this is to give us some safe place, some sort of secure home base to come back to. And this becomes the, the home base that we're going to start out from in each clinical interaction. And then we return to it whenever we perceive that either we or the patient have actually lost that capacity to mentalize. So when, when experienced therapists hear about MBT for the first time, most people say, oh yeah, I do that all the time. And then when we have them actually practice in role plays, the basic mentalizing stance, people actually end up sort of changing their, their tune and saying, actually, this is quite hard. 
I can do it, but it's actually quite hard to do it continuously. So the help comes in MBT in the form of learning and practicing this basic mentalizing stance. So that's part of what we do in the MBT clinic is train people around how to get into this stance and help people in treatment get into this stance. So what are the ingredients of it? So here I'm going to go over the ingredients of this. And as you're listening to this, you might get some, you might think about your own family interactions if you have a loved one who has borderline personality disorder. And you might think if any of these things might help you uh, interact with that person in a different way. So first of all, we're goal-oriented from the get-go. At every possible moment, the goal is to help the individual in treatment mentalize at the highest possible level. His or her own experience while simultaneously mentalizing the experience of other people. So we say good mentalizing in one person in the room usually begets good mentalizing in the other person in the room, and that can work both directions, fortunately. So the therapist is aiming to monitor his or her own mentalizing while also monitoring how well that's going for the patient. So that's the goal orientation that we have, attending to how well we ourselves are mentalizing or the other person. Second of all, we talk about this stance of uncertainty, or the not knowing stance. So a basic premise of this is that we can't fully know our own minds, and we can't fully know other people's minds. We can't fully know even our own mind, if you just think about that for a second. So to try to get to know others and ourselves better, we have to tolerate basic uncertainty and not knowing around this. And this comes up a lot in psychotherapy, when therapists, uh, when patients rather, explain something to a therapist that is totally understandable to the patient, but for whatever reason is maybe not clear to the therapist immediately. And there's one tendency that therapists have is to sort of knowingly nod and say, ah, I see, <coughs> yes, sort of that knowing nod or affirmation when in fact actually the person may not actually be understanding what's being communicated. So in contrast to that, MBT therapists are going to really pounce on that opportunity to uh, see that as an opportunity to in increase the mentalizing going on between the two people and avoid getting into that pretend mode where the therapist is saying yes to things that aren't really understood or, or maybe aren't understandable. So MBT therapists will actually say they don't understand something right away if they don't understand something. And there's something that's very kind of ordinary and conversational about this approach, as I hope you'll see. So many of my patients get annoyed at this initially, and also later on, because I can seem a bit slow in the head sometimes. But over time, this principle of identifying and exploring misunderstandings, as soon as they become apparent, we really seize on that and label them, uh, that helps to increase the quality, the, the quality of the mentalizing in the room. And patients kind of get used to us doing that. Another premise of this not knowing stance is that neither person in the room knows his or her own mind or the other person's mind better than the other person. So we're going to take very seriously any impressions that either of us get about what's going on in the other person. So for example, if uh, someone I'm working with claims to know for certain that I was angry with them, but in that moment I'm not actually aware of myself feeling angry at the person, I'm hopefully not going to say right away, no, I'm not, or no, I wasn't. But I will actually uh, take a stance of curiosity and interest in that. And I might say, well, I'm not aware of having those kinds of you know, anger towards you at the moment. But let's explore exactly how you got to that sense. So we'll go back and I'll say, you know, can you help me see what I've missed here? Because I've clearly missed something. What is it exactly that makes you sure that I'm angry? And sometimes, while I'm authentically trying to kind of explore, actually, it, are they right about this? Did I miss something about anger in myself? Oftentimes, I'll actually come around to seeing that the patient was quite right and that I had missed something about myself or that I was doing something that came off as angry. So then I would say something like, well, you know, I, I wasn't aware of feeling angry when you first brought it up. But now that you mention it and now that we've thought about it together, I think I was frustrated. You know, for example, that you didn't remember what we talked about last time, or something like that. So there's this kind of ordinary conversational transparency about what's going on in both of the minds in the room that's really at the heart of the mentalizing stance. The next one is probably everyone's favorite, avoid bullshitting. 
And we can use bullshitting as a technical term in psychotherapy, actually. So uh, people may be familiar with the philosopher Harry Frankfurt. He wrote this little black book that came out probably five years ago, called, I think called On Bullshit. Has anybody seen this? So he defines bullshit as what happens whenever circumstances require someone to talk without knowing what they're talking about. <laughs> so he says politicians are at huge risk for bullshitting in this way because they get asked a wide range of questions that actually no one could know the answer to in the moment. And John Allen from, Men from the Menninger Clinic, who's really a, a, a great popularizer of mentalizing in this country, points out that therapists are just as much in danger of bullshitting patients. Because patients, understandably, desperately like, want to have answers about certain things. And many therapists desperately want to be helpful and seem knowledgeable. But that's a setup for the therapist starting to talk and provide an answer without actually sorting out whether there is an answer that he's got or not. So if you think about some common questions that therapists get asked, so for example, how long will it take for my depression to go away? Should I give up on my marriage? Do these memories that keep coming to mind mean that I was definitely abused? Or probably the more common one, are you, are you really sure that you can help me? Every other therapist I've worked with has been complete rubbish, but are you sure that you can help me? So therapists who would attempt to answer these kinds of questions in the moment with any sense of certainty put themselves at high risk of bullshitting. I think we could agree about that. So an MBT therapist, instead of making up an answer, or instead of pretending to be confident about an answer when we're not confident about it, we will say, we will own in some form or another that we don't know, or we're not sure at all to, what to say about what's being asked. But we might then go on to sort of think out loud about the question, sort of let someone see how our mind is working around this issue of uncertainty. And then we might explore what it's like for the person to be in therapy with a therapist who doesn't have all the answers, actually. And to sort of come back around to thinking, you know, how does one live with uncertainty in general? This is something that not just patients, but also therapists have to live with. But bullshitting can also work the other way around. So as John Allen points out, not only can therapists bullshit patients, but patients can bullshit therapists as well. Uh, and that's to everyone's detriment. So in order, for example, in order to avoid addressing more painful experiences, patients might talk in elaborate detail for a long period of time about relatively minor concerns. Or they might quickly or kind of flippantly gloss over some problem that seems quite serious actually on the face of it, such as suicidal behavior. Uh, and that might leave the therapist feeling quite concerned about the person when the patient himself appears to be completely unconcerned. And that's often a situation that families get into. So another example would be uh, someone engages in psychobabble, and they end up kind of parroting therapy jargon and cliches from self-help books. And they say things like, I've lost my inner child, or that's just my emotional baggage. You know, these kind of like pat phrases that are kind of non-mentalizing. They don't really explain anything, stock phrases. Uh, and sometimes even diagnostic terms can have that kind of bullshitting or psychobabble function. So sometimes people will say, I don't know why I did that. Maybe it's just because I'm borderline. Well, what does that mean exactly in terms of what led internally to the thing that happened? It's so kind of a non-mentalizing moment. So as MBT therapists, when bullshitting is going on in a therapy session, in either direction, the actual emotional realities of the patient uh, becomes disconnected from what's being talked about. So we call this another kind of pretend mode in MBT. So we're always on the watch, remember, for those three types of non-mentalizing modes. And as soon as we see that, oh, I'm in pretend mode as a therapist, or I wonder if you're in pretend mode, we start to challenge that head on and do things to get the mentalizing capacity going in an alive way, again, in the, in the moment. And that's really to help patients avoid spending lots of time and money on long, dry spells of psychotherapy without any real benefit. But detecting bullshitting or pretend mode in oneself or in another person requires active mentalizing. We have to learn to judge. Is what's being talked about, is it sincere? Does it seem emotionally connected? Uh, does it seem significant to the person who's talking about it? So we have other ways of kind of looking for, for cues about that. And um, it, so in a mentalizing therapy, when we say no bullshitting, we mean 
don't pretend to know things if you really don't know them. You might just say instead, actually, I don't know. I have to think about that. And we also mean don't pretend not to know something when you think you do know something. So be real about that, too. So instead of pretending like you don't know, say something like, well, actually, what's going on for me is I have a sense that I do know. But what I want to know from you is if that's correct or not. Am I right about this? So these are the kinds of tactics that we use to kind of avoid these uh, moments of mutual non-mentalizing that happen in any psychotherapy over time. The next point is active curiosity and questioning. I'll be a bit faster about these others. So this tip is really about avoiding prolonged silences, <laughs> avoiding prolonged <coughs> silences on the therapist's part, but also being careful to not become overly controlling. And this comes from the observation that therapists often get pulled either into excess activity or excess passivity in the room. And the risk of that is, again, that the interactive mentalizing process really gets lost. And therapists can do this and sometimes sit silently for long periods of time and just listening and trying to come up with some really insightful thing to say and, or just hoping that something that isn't making sense that someone is saying is going to suddenly start making sense. But the trouble with long silences is that in BPD, the mentalizing capacity can be very precarious. And so in that situation of prolonged silence, that generates a lot of, that can escalate a person's anxiety about what are you thinking about me right now. And that can rapidly escalate to a situation that becomes more unmanageable. On the other hand, though, sometimes therapists can become excessively active and controlling, if they, particularly if they get afraid about uh, something that someone has said and can become controlling about a person's mental states. And that's usually, as I said, in response to the therapist's own anxiety about something. And that's equally non-mentalizing. So that's another thing we've got to watch out for. Because by telling people what we think they should do or shouldn't do in the moment, we risk sort of taking their mind over from a mentalizing perspective. We're not engaging in a collaborative process to help them make sense of their own mind and conclude from that. We're just sort of giving the contents of our mind. You see how that's different from getting a mentalizing process going. So even problem solving, uh, therapies that have a, a significant problem solving component, for example, DBT, as incredibly useful a treatment as it is, we would want to think about are people delivering DBT skills in like a mentalizing kind of way? Or is someone sort of passively sitting in the DBT skills group and memorizing the mnemonics and learning all the skills without actually translating it into any change. So we would, a, a mentalizing therapist could do a DBT treatment, as I do sometimes, but we're going to add an additional layer into assessing how the interaction is going moment to moment to evaluate how the, the other person's mental processes are engaging with, with my own around these skills. Um, I'm going to move a little bit more quickly because I know we're almost out of time, but uh, I'll just say quickly about identifying, presenting, and comparing alternative perspectives. So the idea here is that we want someone to be able to consider their own perspectives right alongside other people's perspectives, and in this case, the therapist's perspective. And it's not about convincing that one is correct or one is incorrect, but it's about seeing that different perspectives may be acceptable, actually, around the same kind of situation. Next point is transparency and also disclosure about the therapist's own mind. So in MBT, we use judicious disclosure, <coughs> tactful disclosure, about what's going on in our own minds, as I've kind of illustrated for you. And that's actually essential. About, it's an essential way of promoting mentalizing, because one of the principles of getting mentalizing going is that there has to be actually some sense of a positive attachment. There has to be some sense that what going on in the other person's mind matters to me. So one technique we'll use is actually to sometimes disclose something about our own thoughts and feelings about what's going on in the moment. It's usually not autobiographical information, but it's related to the experience the therapist is having in the, in the room in the moment. And as we do that, we're not trying to, when we offer our own perspective, we're not trying to offer a total understanding of the person's experience, but just sort of like some sparks to kind of get the flames of mentalizing going. The next point is a bumbling detective stance. And this gets called the Columbo stance sometimes. So a mentalizing therapist will often sort of express tentativeness or uncertainty or kind of like very cautious questioning 
rather than jumping in and saying, I think this is what's going on, we might say something like, I may be totally wrong about this, but I'm getting the sense that. I'm getting the impression that. Or um, the classic Columbo style is, you know, well, can you help me out here? I'm not quite sure I'm understanding this. Can you help me square this with that, these two things that you've said? So we really are trying to ex actively elicit the patient's participation in that joint mentalizing process. It's all about, it's not about what someone concludes or where they land in terms of decision making, but it's we're more interested in the process of how they get there in response to another mind in the room trying to help them think. Um, moving towards the end, we talk about this ordinary and non-expert stance, and I've kind of illustrated this as we've gone along. So sometimes we say, you know, the ordinary thing about MBT means just saying what you would say to a friend sometimes, if a friend had said or did something that the person you're working with just said or did. Or we talk about normalizing a person's experience by saying, yeah, I would feel the same way, actually. So you see how this ties into all the DBT strategies around validation that people who've done the uh, Family Connections group are probably familiar with. Or we talk about saying what you would say if you were not a therapist. If you were not an expert or a professional, but just a human being, sort of what would that be? What would your basic response be to something? And then finally, humility. I'll just end with this one, and then I think maybe two more slides and we're done. Um, this idea of humility is really an MBT. It's about sort of taking some pleasure, almost, in being corrected. Sort of like coming into the room, both the patient and therapist expecting that we're going to get things wrong. We are bound to misunderstand each other along the way. And when that happens, we get really excited about it. We see it as an opportunity to walk it back and try to parse out exactly how did the misunderstanding develop. And it's through that process of kind of gradually taking it back past the person's uh, emotional distress in the moment and working back towards how did we get there. And we'll often sort of liberally say that we'll own the things that we do as therapists to make things worse for people in the room. So we'll say, now show me what it is that I've done actually to really miss your point. What have I missed? Or show me what I've done to make you angry. I get the sense that you're angry. So it's really kind of this active owning of our contributions to someone having a hard time in the room. And usually whenever we take that stance, we find that actually, in fact, there was something that we did. And we may not have known about it, but there was something we did or didn't do that contributed to someone's difficulty. And it's actually really amazing to see what can happen when you identify in the moment what it was that happened in that transaction, and then both people are able to mentalize around it and take that forward into the next phase of therapy. So we're winding down towards the end. I think it's almost 7 o'clock. I'm going to skip this slide. Um, these are Yeah, so let me just kind of um, close by telling you something about does MBT actually work and what's the data about this approach. I've kind of tried to give you a little bit of a sense about what it's like to be in the room, a little bit of you know, what is mentalizing in general and how do we take this mentalizing stance that facilitates that process. And let me just share a little bit about the evidence for this. And this is all available in published papers online, but basically studies are suggesting more and more that this idea of mentalizing is actually a core basic component of many different psychotherapies if not all of them. Some people will say that the quality of mentalizing in any psychotherapy actually is a direct determinant of how well it goes. I don't know that we have evidence for that, but that's the theory. And um, Vonnegut and Bateman, who developed this treatment in London, really highlight this capacity to mentalize as the core curative element. And they make this, this explicit focus of treatment in uh, MBT. So mentalizing kind of becomes a way of thinking that can be applied to any kind of psychotherapy, even if it's not MBT. We can take a DBT treatment, as I said, and uh, analyze how, how much of a mentalizing process do we have around these skills. Or a psychodynamic or psychoanalytic therapy and analyze, well, you know, has this been a 20, 25, 30 year psychoanalysis in which there's been a lot of apparently insightful talk but someone is still struggling in all the ways that they were 30 years ago. So is there a risk of some pretend mode here? Is there something that's being missed or that needs to be shaken up somehow? So we can sort of apply mentalizing concepts to any kind of therapy to enhance their effectiveness. But then there are a number of studies now specifically uh, testing the usefulness of MBT as a packaged treatment program, which is what we do here in the MBT clinic. And basically the treatment consists of once a week individual therapy, 
with an MBT therapist, once a week MBT group, and uh, medication management with a psychiatrist who is MBT oriented. And then there are team meetings, so it's a highly team oriented treatment where everyone on the team is thinking about the patient's problems from this MBT perspective. And there's this mentalizing culture that gets created in staff meetings where people are quick to correct each other and sort of point out when we're missing something about a case. And so we create this mentalizing culture that is to support the therapist's ability to mentalize well with the patient. And we also, in our clinic, involve uh, video-based supervision. And uh, we supervise each other in terms of uh, watching, playing back, actually, videotapes of sessions to sort of learn more about where we miss each other in the moments. So let me just share with you what the studies about this approach to treatment show. So the original studies tested uh, one and a half year long partial hospital program. And since then, uh, studies have tested uh, outpatient programs. So not a day hospital, but just a more standard outpatient clinic program. And what the studies show is that MBT is extremely effective for many of these outcomes that we all care about in borderline personality disorder and on the level of other evidence-based treatments. So for example, um, suicide, decreasing suicide attempts, decreasing the number of hospitalizations, decreasing the amount of medication that people feel they need to be prescribed, <coughs> decreasing self-reported symptoms of depression or anxiety, improving interpersonal functioning, decreasing the length of outpatient treatment, improving overall functioning, improving vocational functioning, and one of the amazing things about it is in the longest running study, these benefits appear to last eight years or more. And that's as far as that that's been tested so far. And that's with sort of minimal amount of maintenance therapy. So another thing that MBT is really trying to do is to really uh, maximize the, eff the efficacy of a shorter term treatment. And also a treatment that we can teach people to do, perhaps with a little bit less uh, less time intensive resources available. Because as great a treatment as DBT is, for example, it's a time intensive thing to learn and it's not something that uh, any given therapist in any part of the world will have the resources to be able to learn. But one of the ideas about MBT is that because it's kind of this commonsensical approach to thinking about the mind, that it is something that actually can be taught effectively to therapists in a much shorter period of time. And that's what the studies appear to be bearing out at this point. So I'll finish up here. Uh, I've kind of said all of this already, but I'll finish with this slide, I promise. So how can you as family members kind of capture this spirit of mentalizing to help your loved ones with BPD? Well, first, uh, as this quote shows, kind of keep in mind that there is no context more likely to induce a loss of mentalizing oh. than family relationships. <laughs> because if you think about it, why? These are intense relationships. They go back a long period of time. There's often a tense feelings attached to them, even in the here and now. Uh, and um, there's a lot, of, a lot of shared history. So there's a lot of room for misunderstandings. And there are relationships that people care deeply about. So <laughs> once you appreciate that, here are a couple of things to do. First, assess, just think for a bit about your family's mentalizing culture. And what I mean by that is assess for yourself where does your family's ability to mentalize as a group kind of go offline. And for a lot of families, this can be in the form of like taboo topics, things that are kind of unsp never spoken about, but there is a sense that we don't talk about Uncle Frank or something like that or where he went for those three months. And things like that that just don't get explicitly mentalized or talked about? Are there specific situations where your ability to mentalize as an individual kind of goes offline? Notice what those triggers are. You know, for example, you might be a really good mentalizer as a parent, except when your loved one is furious with you. It's hard for anyone to mentalize well when someone is furious with you. Right? Second of all, just consider that family dynamics actually can be improved as each family member works on improving their own mentalizing processes and works as a group to focus on better mentalizing what each person in the group is thinking and feeling. And then thirdly, when you sense in the moment yourself or your loved one losing mentalizing capacity, practice adopting some of that, <coughs> that basic mentalizing stance. 
And I think I'm over time, so I'd better stop with that. I'm happy to stick around for questions. And uh, there's a flyer that went around if people are interested in knowing more about mentalizing or the MBT clinic that we do here. My last pitch will be to say that uh, something I'm very proud of is that unlike any of the other uh, borderline personality disorder programs here at the hospital, we are entirely insurance-based. So this is one of the, tr the ideas about MBT is that, again, it can be delivered in a less resource-intensive environment with actually equivalent gains, it looks like, when we do these bigger studies. So it is an insurance-based treatment that is not out of pocket, and that's, uh, for some people, the only kind of treatment that they can afford. And we're sort of proud to occupy that niche here at the hospital. All right, I've talked enough at you. Thanks for listening. I hope that was helpful. Uh, given that everyone has you know, individualized factors that influence the shape of their treatment and the ability to recover, um, how, what, what general conclusions can we take away about duration of treatment? So if we go back to this slide, um, these outcome measures that were tracked here actually uh, were shown in the one and a half year study. So within a period of uh, even as early as uh, 12 months, many of these variables start to show significant change and then even more so at 18 months, and then even more so <coughs> over later periods of time. So it is highly uh, person dependent, so I probably can't give you uh, a more specific answer about it. But uh, roughly the same time course that we see with CBT <coughs> and some of the other evidence-based treatments. Yeah. Is it readily available? It's a really good question. So, um, you know, it's interesting, this idea of is one treatment the gold standard for borderline personality disorder? And I don't know if John Gunderson talked about this at all when he was here a few months back, but actually most people in the field, most experts would say that actually the data show there really is no gold standard for BPD in general, but that I think we're in an age of really trying to integrate and look at what are the core common shared principles that are, that are in common between a lot of the evidence-based treatments. So what is there about DBT that works really well for some people in certain situations? And what is there about MBT that appeals to certain other kinds of folks and works better in certain other situations? And I personally am very interested in this idea of integrating skills and approaches from different treatments in a, in a more evidence-based kind of way. So I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I think we would say that it's not clear that, that DBT or any other treatment is like the gold standard for any person, but that it really requires some more careful evaluation about, you know, we'll give somebody some education about what DBT entails, what it looks like to use a diary card, what it looks like to be in that kind of an alliance with a therapist, and then maybe someone will learn something about MBT, and you say, you know, that, that model of thinking about myself works better for me. And you know we're still learning a lot about this. There's not a lot of evidence yet about which models of treatment work better for different people at different points in time. But I think that's where we're headed. People may be aware that if people have, have come through, say, the Gunderson Outpatient Program, formerly the Borderline Center, that that is an example of an eclectic uh, treatment model. So where I, even though some people in the Borderline Center Program have you know a more treatment like a more adherent DBT treatment. Uh, they're still getting interpersonal groups, uh, self-assessment groups. There's still a, a mixture of ingredients kind of thrown together. So I think where we're headed here, not just at McLean, but in the field of treating BPD in general, is to, again, integrate uh, whatever works for each patient in a given you know, sort of clinical moment in their treatment. And we're still learning a lot about how to predict what works better for different people. I mean, I find that uh, some people, uh, when they learn about a little bit about MBT, they say, whoa, this is like too spacey for me. This is very vague sounding. It doesn't feel concrete enough. Um, they don't like something about it. And that probably matters, but we don't have much evidence about how much or to what degree that matters for that kind of treatment being useful to someone. Some people, when they go to a DBT skills group, they really lock on to that right away. This is the treatment for me. And you know, we can say some things about what might work better. So DBT has you know, didactic component around teaching distraction skills, distress tolerance skills. And for some people who are struggling with high intensity of, of self-destructive behaviors, some of those folks might say, I, I need to actually learn those behavioral skills. That's the most important thing. But maybe later on in treatment, someone says, all right, I've learned those behavioral skills and can manage my emotional intensity and behaviors a little bit better. But what about this problem of emptiness? 
what about feeling like I don't have a sense of self? I don't know who I am or I'm a chameleon, or I really still have a lot of problems in interpersonal relationships, even though I know the interpersonal effectiveness skills. Well, maybe for that kind of person, you would wonder whether a more MBT-based exploratory treatment or a TFP-based treatment that really focuses more intensively on the relationship in the room. That might not be something that someone who's actively in the throes of a lot of self-injurious behavior can handle until they learn some behavioral skills for managing emotions at that level. So anyway, there's a lot of different ways that we're thinking about trying to blend these things. That was a very long-winded answer. But it sounds intense. Okay. That's right. Sometimes the emotional arousal is, is so right. high that a per literally a person's ability to think or mentalize is just, not, it's just offline. So we need to do something in the moment to help them reduce the emotional arousal. And that can be done through giving a person behavioral skills. Let's go hold some ice. Let's go count down from 100 by threes, that sort of thing. Or uh, it can be done with some mentalizing techniques as well. You know, to go back and appreciate something about how someone's mm -hmm. feeling, to do validation. So again, people in the multiple, uh, in the family connections group probably have seen that when you get more skilled at validating your family members, it makes a huge difference. And it can help to bring down that emotional distress in the moment. Um, was there one more question in the back? Yeah. Well, I think what we, I, certainly the DBT, um, the, the folks that would represent DBT, I'm thinking of Jillian and Michael Hollander, and that would say they're primarily DBT therapists, I think would not agree that DBT is a less deep treatment, and I wouldn't say that either, you know, that it's a less deep treatment or that the validation isn't so deep. But I think what you're getting at is that in MBT, we really do try to have as a focus the, the, the mental processes of the patient. So yes, we're paying attention to the level of emotional arousal and how to help somebody get that down to a manageable level, but we're also thinking at the same time quite a lot about uh, the attachment relationship in the room and how a person's mind is actually helping them to bring down the emotional intensity. So the focus is maybe just a little bit different uh, if you're in an MBT treatment, but I wouldn't say one is necessarily like deeper than the other. Yeah, so that's, that's one of the, attachment theory is pretty deep and deeper than I would claim to understand. But I think each of the evidence-based treatments, and maybe we'll end with this if people need to go, but each of the evidence-based treatments for BPD comes with its own theory about the origins of BPD, right? So again, DBT is the biosocial theory and talks about the transaction between invalidating environment and emotional vulnerability. Right? Well, MBT talks about a transactional relationship in an attachment context. And as you said, posits that insecure attachment is really the origin of some of the vulnerabilities to mentalizing. But what I'm saying is the, the, the core physiology is invalidating the environment. So it's stopping mm -hmm. that emotional dysregulation and invalidating the environment. Mm. And, uh, and then I feel MBT goes a little bit more you know, too short to serve for that. So yeah, so one. In line with this, but so one of the things we do in the MBT clinic is we try to take a, an attachment history when we are doing an intake with someone who's beginning in the program. We try to get that that history about how someone's mind works in important attachment relationships, and you know that would be similar to what a DBT therapist would do probably, but it might just be thinking about it with different concepts. So anyway, I'm happy to keep stick around and keep talking about it, but we should probably let people go. So. Thanks for your attention.